and welcome to another edition of the Inside Texas Football YouTube channel brought to you and powered by InsideTexasFootball.com. I'm your host, Justin Wells, and today is X's and O's. We do this every week where we gather in the, the beautiful minds of the Inside Texas crew, and, and we talk about schemes, we talk about uh, tendencies, we talk about formations, and we talk about how it all kind of comes together for these Texas football players heading into the 2024 season. Joining me today are two of the best. I mean, they, they don't need much introduction, introduction, but I'll go ahead and, and get it clear. We got Drew Kelson to my left, main man from DBU, University of Texas national champion and, and, and resident smart man. We got Paul Waddlington, another of the, uh, of the, the Texas burn orange clad and, and also viewed as smart one, one A and one B. So we got we got the good minds on today, guys. And the truth is we got to catch up the viewers because we, there's a lot of new portal additions. And we need to know how these guys are going to fit, how it's going to affect the depth chart and kind of how it's going to uh, affect the 2024 class, you know, heading uh, 24 season heading into into this year. Uh, it's a lot to cover. But, man, there's there's some really good stuff coming up right now. First off, please like and please subscribe to the Inside Texas Football YouTube channel. Give us get, get us the 6000 subs. We're getting close. We're growing at a crazy rate. And it's because we get guys like like Drew and, and Paul on these things on a regular basis. Please do that. And please come see us at InsideTexas.com. We're having a special right now, a dollar for a month. And really, you know, there isn't a better time. The Texas football program is on a crazy trajectory. It continues to climb. And this is a great time to get in. Let us earn your dollar. We got a great community. It started off with a little bit of news. We're going to tease a little bit of news, and that is cornerback transfer Jabbar Muhammad at the University of Washington via Oklahoma State, via DeSoto High School. Uh, Jabbar hit the portal a few days ago. Uh, I believe it was right after Kalen DeBoer took the Alabama job. And we're recording this on Wednesday. And so as we record this, uh, understand that Muhammad's going to be on campus by the time you see this. And so the wheels are moving. And if if, we, if Sark has shown any in indication of how well the wheels are moving, um, they, they only target a few guys in the portal. And if they bring you on campus, they really like you. And so I, I think Texas and, and Muhammad are going in, in a good direction. I want to throw this at Drew real quick. You know, the secondary reloaded and they brought back a lot of guys. And, and Muhammad's one of those lockdown style type corners. Where do you see him fitting potentially when you've got almost a log jam at that spot now with, 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 with Malik Muhammad, his, his cousin, uh, Terrence Brooks, and a number of young guys coming up and like Santana Wilson and, and, and Mordell Mack? Well, I know I've, I've said this a few times already, but I, I know for a fact all positions are open. Uh, that, that includes Malik Muhammad. That includes everyone. Everyone knows that they're competing coming into this season. I do think uh, with Ryan Watts no longer being on campus, uh, it does open up some opportunities. But Terrence Brooks is going to be fighting for his job. Um, everybody's going to be fighting for these spots. And Jam Jabbar Muhammad raises the bar when it comes to covering that corner. Um, just watching him, his game, and even leading into the game we played against Washington, I think uh, – Paul, I know you, myself, and Ian, I mean, when we were looking at that roster, we were saying who could give us issues at, at corner, uh, who can give us issues amongst their DBs. He was the one we knew we couldn't just take advantage of, uh, of that bunch up at Washington. And now that we have an opportunity to bring him down here, especially after watching him in that game against us, uh, he was always in control. He was always where he needed to be uh, in coverage. And uh, he did not shy away from the competition. Um, we tried to take some shots. We tried to attempt to go after him, and he, he proved that he he could be in position on the biggest stage. So I just appreciate that we're going to raise the level of competition uh, this off season. Hopefully with him coming into the fold, because uh, I know guys like Warren Robinson, are, they're chomping at the bit too and wanting to get opportunity this year too. So uh, really excited to have him on campus. We'll see what happens in the next 24, 48 hours. You know, we're going to start on the defensive side with the guys that are in. The guys that have already enrolled, that are already taking classes, that are already Texas Longhorns. And we're going to start with maybe the most important position on the defense, and that's edge. And they grabbed a man named Trey Moore out of UTSA. And in two seasons at UTSA, this kid basically bet on himself and won. He was unbelievable uh, for Jeff Trailer and the Roadrunners. This is a kid that had zero stars coming out of Smithson Valley High School. 
and, and, and to turn himself into a four-star portal type guy, that just speaks volumes. And I actually caught up with a couple staffers from UTSA before this happened, and they all said the same thing. Trey Moore is a better kid than he is player, and he is one hell of a player. Paul, Texas got to get to the quarterback. We, we, we've said this for a few years now. We're going to continue to say it. Tell me about Trey Moore and tell me how he closes that gap. The Yeah, AAC Defensive Player of the Year, Trey Moore. So 14 sacks last year. That's great production. Eight sacks the year before that. So this wasn't just a fluke. Uh, we'll, we'll take that. The thing that strikes me about Trey is I think he's going to fit into our defense Maybe not just lined up at edge, but actually playing linebacker as well. I think he's going to have two distinct roles. I think he's going to play linebacker, sort of that Jet Bush role that we had yeah. uh, this last year. And then I think he's also going to have some pure edge packages as well. Uh, the one thing I'll notice if you watch his film, he's not necessarily taking the corner, bending, breaking down a guy's arms, and then sticking the quarterback, right? It's not classic Bruce Smith type uh, sack highlights. It's more pursuit. It's more there's a blitz and he works the offensive lineman. He'll go inside. He'll, he'll do a spin. A lot of it's pursuit. The guy, the quarterback gets initially flushed and Trey Moore knocks the guy's hands off, off of him and he goes and runs down the quarterback, right? Flushers and chasers. Trey Moore is a chaser. So okay. if we've got some flushers inside like Alfred Collins, like Vernon Broughton, like a Jare Bledsoe, he's the guy that goes and runs him down. And finishes the play. And, and that's something the last couple of years that the Texas defense hasn't necessarily had. You know, Baron Sorrell, athletic guy, not, not really a chaser. Not the guy that finishes that flush and runs down the quarterback, right? So I think that's what Trey Moore brings. I think he's going to be a little bit more of a situational player than an every down player. But TBD, he's going to come in in the spring. He's going to show us what he's got. And the good news that I can throw out to both of y'all gentlemen is typically these guys at the G5 level who really excel translate well when they get their shot at the P5 opportunity in the big league, so to speak. It's actually usually the five-star third teamer from Georgia or Bama that doesn't <laughs> necessarily pan out, right? Right. Uh, and people are still going off his star rating in high school. Well, your star rating gets readjusted because there's there's college football that got played. And Trey Moore played real good college football. One thing I will throw out, and it's not a condemnation or it's just a thing to notice. Uh, 11 and a half of his 14 sacks came in four games. So clusters, right? Three and a half against UAB, three against Texas State, three against East Carolina, two against Rice. So that could be a function of his matchups. It could be a function of the game plan. You know, they, they brought heavy blitz and Trey Moore feasted. Uh, but, you know, he's not a guy that's a steady one sack a game, two pressures a game guy. He tended to go feast or famine uh, throughout last year. So that'll be very interesting as well, which reinforces my sense that he might be a matchup guy. He might be a guy that we have for certain game plans as like, this is going to be a Trey Moore game. And then I think there might be certain game plans where he might not see 20, 25 snaps. So, you know, we'll, we'll see. We're going to stay at that level. We're going to go back a little, a few steps and, and talk about linebacker Kendrick Blackshire, uh, the, the, one of the newest, if not the, the newest enrollee from the transfer portal for the University of Texas. This is a former Duncan, uh, uh, you know, Alabama linebacker. He played there for three years, didn't have very many numbers. And, and as, you know, Joe Cook and I talked about yesterday in his commitment video, um, he was just a product of being behind bigger, better guys. I mean, that's what happens at Alabama. Sometimes your second string and third string are good players. They're just not first string yet. It, that's a, If there's a tough, tough depth chart, it's probably in Tuscaloosa. But Blackshire, and, and from what I understand, their, their sales pitch, and that's PK and Johnny Nanson's sales pitch, is essentially he's going to play inside linebacker. Uh, they feel like they need run stuffers at linebacker. And they feel like there's going to be bully ball uh, early on in the SEC. And if they can't stop the run, people are just going to continue to run it down their throat till they can. Blackshire is a big dude. He's six two and a half, about 245. I covered him in high school at Mesquite Horn. I met him as a sophomore. Um, you could see the frame. You could see the, the intensity 
when he played. Then he transferred to Duncanville and, and, and had a great career. And then obviously back on to Alabama. You know, linebackers is a room, Drew, that they lost Jalen Ford. And, and Blackshire's not going to replace that. And they got, but they got David Benda back. And they've got a, a growing Maurice Blackwell, in addition to the, the highly developing Anthony Hill. You know, how important is that run stuffer, you know, in the SEC? How important is to have a guy like the shooting gaps and, and, and plugging and plugging holes and, and not getting caught up in the wash? You know, something like a Gary Johnson, in a sense, like always, always hitting that gap. How important do you think that is? I think it's critical just to, to have a higher floor at linebacker. Uh, you're great. You're, you're, you're good linebackers. You want to do the normal exceptionally well. You want them to do the repetitive normal things exceptionally well. So coming in and learning the defense and just learning how to fit the gaps and physically fitting the gaps. So, I mean, you saw early in Anthony Hill's tenure here, he was still learning that even though he was a great asset, he was great to have on the field. That was something that was a learning curve for him. Hopefully this is a guy that comes in and already has those instincts and can kind of be a leader in that way. With Jalen Ford leaving, I mean, we really do have younger linebackers there, especially in the middle. I mean, we have David Bender coming back, but experienced guys who are used to filling in gaps in the middle, um, it's 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 going to be something that, that that's going to be challenging uh, this 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 spring. So uh, hope, hopefully he comes in with that ready to go and raising the bar there. And then from there is just competition. I think you want all of your linebackers to be able to do the basics, but then you want to see what are the X factors. I don't know enough about him to see what his X factors are going to be. Um, is he going to be great in pass coverage? Is he going to be great in rushing the passer? Um, is he going to be a great leader, a great vocal leader and communicator and kind of doing those things? And so I do feel we should be able to coach the guys we have to a certain standard to where they can all contribute and do the things we need to stop the run. Uh, but I'm more interested in seeing what X factors he has now that we'll have him on campus and be able to have some insights. Absolutely. Um, we're going to – oh, you throw it in, Paul. I, yeah, just a quick thought on that to build on that. So I think he's a situational piece that we're going to see featured in certain games. And I think part of that has to do with the fact that we just lost two very unique assets in front, Byron Murphy and Tavondre Sweat, <laughs> both of whom are players who can anchor and penetrate. Right now, think about their replacements. Are they anchor guys or are they more penetrators? Penetrators, right? Yeah. Alfred Collins, Vernon Broughton, they're not anchor mm -hmm. dudes, right? Mm -hmm. That they can just neutralize a double team like Devondre. <laughs> I've seen Devondre not get down in his stance in time on a fourth and one and just stand and neutralize the guy in front of him and throw him backwards in the, in the running back. That's a rare attribute. If you don't have that guy up front just providing that anchor ability, you need to have a linebacker behind him who can do that. And that's what I see in Blackshire. I mean, he's all of 245. That dude is jacked. Like, talk about first first off the bus. I gotta We got to ask Drew if that's actually a thing. Did you guys ever arrange yourselves? Like, who gets off the bus first? Uh, but uh, punter, no, you cannot get off the bus first. You're last. Uh, but, yeah, uh, Rod, get up there in front. But, yeah, I, I just think that's going to be an interesting piece for Blackshire. Kind of similar to Trey Moore, although Trey Moore will have more utility down to down. I think there will be certain games or quarters where a team's running inside zone or they're running some power concepts on us. And we're going to go, hey, get Blackshire in there. Let's let's stop that. Let's get some physicality at inside linebacker to, to provide a little pop in there. Anyway, that's my thought. Hey, hey, Paul. Get, and I remember hey, Paul. Blackshire. I thought he was going to turn into a defensive lineman. Because he was 225, 230 as a sophomore and junior in high school. I thought, man, you're growing into the interior. And he would just he'd be emphatic about, no, I'm a linebacker. I'm going to be a linebacker. What do you think, Drew? No, I'm just it, now it's no longer who gets off the bus first because that it's who walks out of the tunnel first. Because I tell you, you see the measurables of these kids when you're looking at the lineups and the depth charts and you just see them on film. And then it's like, what's the reality? And so I do think. You have guys, you want to see them walk out of the tunnel and warm up, you know, with their shoulder pads off, just kind of jogging around first in a stadium. So they can just get a real sense of, okay, like that, that dude's a legit 6'2", 6'3", 240. All right. Like, we, we have to show up and be ready to, to be physical. You want that with your offensive lineman and your defensive lineman too. You want them out there on the field just warming up before anybody else. On that point, Drew, just very quickly, uh, 
I, I, a friend of mine was telling me that Casey Studdard told him that when y'all went to go play Missouri at Missouri, uh, you saw him come out like doing the warm ups, and people were like, oh, like we didn't expect these guys look like legit. We didn't expect that. And Casey said that he and the offensive linemen were like, whoa, look at these dudes. Dude. And then uh, he said after like the second play from scrimmage, Casey looked at a guy and he goes, we're fine. <laughs> I felt the same way about their tight ends. Mizzou used to have some tight ends, dude. They, they just walk out there. They're stretched six, 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 seven. You're like, Martin Rucker. Even as a linebacker, yeah, you can cover, but when you're dealing with tight ends that big. Anyway, uh, the, the eye test really matters. <laughs> and, and some of these guys, you definitely won't walk out of the tunnel early. But, yeah, Mizzou, Mizzou did bring back some memories in that way. Hey, Justin, we got to figure out the hierarchy of who walks out the tunnel for inside Texas. Yeah, you know what? Um, that's actually a good question. That's a good question. Ian, yeah. <laughs> you know, Ian first. Ian, Just Ian, in the in the in the the lady in the shoe, essentially, um, <laughs> with, with with his. And congratulations to our Ian Boyd, who became a, a father. Him and his wife, Cat. Biggest congrats. They had their their fourth child yesterday or two days ago, and they're so thankful that they're about to be heading home and, and everybody's healthy and blessed. And so we're thinking about Amen. you, Ian, and we love you and Cat. Um, let's go back to another level. Let's go to the secondary and let's talk about a guy that Texas should have had the first time. And that's local LBJ cat, Andrew Makuba, who essentially bought the, the Dabu Sweeney hook, went out to Clemson, played well, especially his, his freshman year, uh, made all a ACC and decided this year, you know, he'd like to uh, be reunited with his old high school coach, Jamal Finner, who happens to be the uh, high school relations a director for the University of Texas makes a lot of sense. This is a two pronged one, guys, because I thought this was big anyway. And now you add the fact that Jade Barron's coming back because Makuba was kind of penciling in at that star. Now, to me, the rich are getting richer. I'm gonna start with you, Drew. How big is 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 getting that kid like a Makuba who is like you said in some in, in some aspects? There's no position. Like these guys have to learn all these different spots. Like Baron, who can play corner in a pinch, who can play safety in a pinch. I feel like Makuba is kind of like that as well. I think it just I keep saying this, but this is one thing I appreciate about the portal. It 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 it, it allows for competition. It raises the bar for what expectations are. Uh, no one can get comfortable. You can feel like you're the next guy in line as a safety, as a DB, as a linebacker, as a deep. Doesn't matter you can't get comfortable because there's always someone else that can come in and it's going to come in and compete. So Makuba comes in with, 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 with the history of, of versatility, a history of production, and he's coming home. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and he's a much needed player too, at a position of need. So I'm looking forward to seeing where he fits. Uh, we know he can play multiple roles for us. And with Jade coming back, um, You'd like to think this is one of those plug and play positions, uh, positions. And gosh, man, I'm just excited for this spring because that was a much needed. It's one thing to plug in guys that are just filler filling in uh, and no, no disrespect to like Gavin Holmes came in last year was great to compete and great to come in and kind of see where he stood amongst our corners. But uh, this is a bona fide guy who's played at a high level. So, uh, our expectations for him is to contribute right away. So I'm looking forward to to him showing how it's done or how he's done it uh, and hopefully helping young Derek Williams develop uh, as well as playing alongside side Michael Taft as he get, gets up to speed on things. Paul, how quick, you know, how, you know, Barron coming back, huge. I, I, I used to maintain that if, if you're talking about the two best players on the defense at Texas this last year, it was Sweat and Murphy. And everyone would ask, well, who's the third? And I would always say Barron. I, I, I felt like his – he is such a smart guy. I don't think people realize how intelligent this kid is really on and off the field. Uh, he, he is a high, high IQ kid. You know, how valuable is him coming back and a kid like Makuba being back there? And they grew up together, you know, it, you know, because Barron's a, a local kid, kid uh, out of Pflugerville as well. How valuable is that? Sec I mean, how fat is that secondary starting to get? Yeah, it's it's getting fat. Uh, did you mean P-H-A-T or F-A-T? Of course, the PHAT is the only fat I know. Like, give me a fat beat when they used to do the old bad Longhorn <laughs> intro. <laughs> oh, man. 
Hey, Great. they're better than that. I'll say that. Uh, hey, you guys nailed it. And and Makuba was J Jade insurance, right? Yeah. Yeah. He was gonna play and play nickel. <laughs> By the way, if your safety is athletic enough to play nickel, that speaks well of him playing safety, right? I mean, because nickel, particularly in modern defense, right? The, the modern base uh, is a nickel. It's your five DBs is the assumption of your base defense, right? I mean, yeah. True, you're you're so old school. You played back when there was four DBs on the field, right? Uh, yeah. You know, just now it's it's all changed, right? These kids today throwing the ball around. So I think you you have to admire the fact that he's got the flexibility that he could play nickel, which speaks about not only ability to play the run, but you can actually play a slot who you don't have the ability to put hands on, right? Yeah. You can't really yeah. press a slot in the traditional sense. So. Uh, Makuba also, beyond that, the guy's played 35 games at a high college level, 31 as a starter. He was the ACC Freshman Defensive Player of the Year, and then he's been honorable mention ACC the last couple of years. I don't think Nickel was his best deployment necessarily. I think that's where he had to play to make the Clemson secondary work. And so, you know, he played with some dudes like Jer Jeremiah Trotter. I know Clemson's taken a step down. The step down's on offense. It ain't, it's not on their defense. They still got guys out there. And Makuba was one of those guys. He's also considered a leader. Uh, and he's also more slightly built. You know, he he yeah. runs well. And I think that suits – hey, we all want a 215-pound Jalen Ramsey out there running around, you know, who can lock dudes down. But there's a reason there's only one of them, right? right. So given my choice – I'll take the slider guy who can run around in today's game. And uh, I think Makuba fits that bill. So I love his schematic flexibility. He can play a lot of different roles, a lot of different positions. And he's a super experienced veteran dude. He's been there, done that, played in high pressure situations. Uh, that's a huge asset to your secondary. You know, I, I always say that the, the positional group, they're most like the DBs is actually the offensive line. Mm -hmm. Because the more they play together, the better they get. And yeah. kind of like the offensive line, if you just have one dude who's not up to par, it kind of messes up the whole thing. So I don't know that's my grand theory on it. Maybe Drew can wax on that. No, no, that, hey. that, that, that that's the absolute truth, Paul. <laughs> and, and, sure. and think about it like this too. You know, I don't think this has been mentioned, but Barron hasn't played a healthy season in Austin yet. Last three years, he's been injured in some form or fashion. Mm -hmm. So he's, he's got, you know, that's, this is more depth. This is, this is, Hey, something happens to him. He can slide down. You know, Gilbo is going to be fighting for that spot in the spring too, to try to find reps as well. And so um, I, I think it's a great spot. You mentioned Jeremiah Trotter jr. I had, you, you set me up because I remember Jeremiah Trotter senior when he was at hooks high school in East Texas. And so uh, he was a man at SFA Stephen F Austin university. Uh, before he went on to form uh, fame and fortune for the Philadelphia Eagles. And so uh, thank you for letting me slide in in East Texas reference. Also, we got to pay the bills. And that, that that means Andre the lawyer, okay? Andre the lawyer, he is the, the man located in Dallas, Texas. He's the guy you need when it comes to, to injuries, when it comes to car wrecks, slip and falls, 18-wheeler accidents, on-the-job injuries, wrongful deaths. Andre is the man you need to call. If you ever get in that position, this is a guy. 214-444-8808. Call Andre. He is a longtime reader of Inside Texas. He'll help anyone, especially Longhorns. If you ever need you need someone, you're getting in and you get in that position, give Andre a buzz. 214-444-8808. Now we slide to the offense and we hit one room. That's the only room we're going to hit right now. Because that's the room that took the biggest hit. Last year, we were worried about running back. That wound up being a strength. Now you lose 80% of your catches <laughs> in the wide receiver room. So what did Sark and, and Kyle Flood and A.J. Milwee and, and specifically Chris Jackson do? They threw out a bunch of hooks. Because when some of these guys hit the portal, it was reload time. We'll start with Matthew Golden. You know, I wanted to say he's the speedster, but – all three of these dudes could, could be called the speedster. I mean, Isaiah Bond had a 21 one 200. These guys are, these guys can fly. Golden was a 10, five kid in high school. 
And we saw what he did at the University of Houston against Texas. He used Terrence Brooks against himself. Of course, Keaton Crawford was in bad position, but I digress. Matthew Golden is coming in to play that outside spot. Now, originally, I think he was going to be in the Xavier Worthy role. Now, I think with the addition of Isaiah Bond and Silas Bolden, who we'll talk about, I think he comes over to the other side now. I think there's so much versatility and flexibility with these guys. There's so many interchangeable parts. Um, Paul, Matthew Golden, what do you like and what is he going to do in his first year in Austin? I like Golden a lot. Um, he he kind of had legendary high school status. And I know there was a lot of Brian people King. that were – a lot of people were con- like concerned, why aren't we going after this guy as, as hard as we should? Because he was he – was, Better than U of H good. He was definitely Texas good. He was anywhere good. He was better than Brendan Thompson, the guy they took good. There you go. So in terms of pure ability, he's he's really talented. And I don't think he's been able to fully put it together. Uh, Partly, he came in as a freshman when they had Clayton Toon, who's a a legitimate high-level college quarterback. Sorry? Oh, sorry. Heard some interference there. I'm, I'm hearing voices, guys. It's the portal. It's opening in my mind. <laughs> it's the pills. <laughs> it is. It is. Uh, Matthew Golden. So he, uh, he he showed out as a true freshman at Houston, got banged yeah. up a little bit. And that is something that you do need to be a little cautious with with Golden. Um, he's a strong guy. He's a hard worker. He's had some soft tissue injuries the last couple of years that have limited him a little bit. Groin, foot, hamstring. And he's not had complete seasons either as a freshman or a sophomore. But when he plays, he's he's one of the best players on the field. And Texas fans certainly saw that when we played Houston. He scored twice. Uh, the week before, he brought back a kick against West Virginia, 100 yards, which was an incredible kick return. He did it again earlier in the year against TCU. So this guy isn't just useful on the offense. He's a real weapon as a kickoff returner and special teamer. I don't know if he's going to be tried as a punt returner. That might be another one of these gentlemen we're going to talk about in a moment. But uh, I, I love Golden's raw ability. Uh, I think he is a guy who can operate on crossing routes, and he can also take the top off. Good hands. Uh, just a good all-around player that has come where nowhere close to his peak. And I think that's the exciting thing about all of these guys is it's actually, you know, as, as we like to joke at IT, the year before the year, right? Golden is poised. This junior year is his contract year. This is the year. And you're going to notice that's a common theme with these wide receiver additions, that this is kind of the year to show out, and we got them at that time. Drew, we got a guy that Texas faced in in week two in Tuscaloosa, and Isaiah Bond. And I actually remember Isaiah through his recruitment. Uh, I believe it was out of Georgia. And Texas offered him, and it was in the mix for a while, but ultimately he chose uh, the, uh, the Crimson Tide. Uh, coming off those years of, of Devontae Smith and, and and Henry Ruggs and John Mechie and, and Jerry Judy. I mean, I, I'm sure I'm forgetting Jalen Waddell. My God, no wonder he went to Bama. Um, and, of course, Sark was there at the same time. So they have somewhat of a connection. You, We watched him play. This is a, you know, I wanted to say speedster with Golden. Bond's not slow in any stretch either. What do you remember that you saw about him? And, and, and what do you think he adds to this wide room, uh, room as well? So one of the key things I saw this year, and this this is kind of the, this whole group of guys that that we were able to pull in, kind of takes me back to Quinn. This is Quinn's contract year. Um, yes. What does Quinn need going into this year? Um, it's one thing to have, and not to say that we had possession receivers prior, but we need game breakers. Uh, we need guys. We had explosive runs last year. Um, we had explosive deep ball passes, but just explosive catches that receivers made plays with after the catch. These guys can all bring that element to this game. And I think Quinn really can use some guys who would do a little more work for him just across the field, no matter who he throws the ball to. uh, They they can be reliable catching the ball and making big plays in the end zone. And Isaiah Bond has shown it. I mean, if you look through this season, I mean, even even the Auburn game, which there's a highlight play there, but you don't just – do that as a, this isn't some miracle play like a couple of years ago against Kansas State where you get the walk right. on and catch the tight end. This is a guy who proven uh, he's had the skill set uh, to to execute in that way time and time again throughout this season. 
Unfortunately, we saw that even though we walked away with a win, but I'm just excited for him to be a target for Quinn that we know can do something with the ball after the catch, uh, but also can be very key in the end zone, uh, especially replacing uh, Adonai Mitchell after leaving this year. Hey, three for three, you know, Sark and Chris Jackson had the hat trick when Silas Bolden committed yesterday. And, and, you know, Bolden was supposed to take a few more visits. He was supposed to actually take a visit to Arizona, another trip to Washington, and then potentially USC. Jed Fish obviously takes the, the, the UW job. And so we, we, we figured, hey, he's going to go up there this weekend and, and, and get their sell. He's from Rancho Cucamonga, which I, didn't, I never knew was a real place. Until I watched the movie next Friday, I thought that was a made-up neighborhood where everybody's house was purple. Um, but no, but, but Eric Nolene, our, our West coast guy assured me it, it's a real place. And so with Bolden jump in the mix, I think this is where Ian would, would chime in with his water bug theory, because granted he's a little thicker than your typical water bug, but my goodness, he's a little, he's a little gadget back type at, at five, eight, and, you know, probably 190, 195 pounds. He was explosive for Oregon state this year, Paul, you know, it's almost like, they're adding so many guys. You know, I've had people ask me, that's that's almost too many, too many wide receivers. There's only one football. I, you know, how's that rotation going to look? And I, my answer is, this is the Pete Carroll, you know, uh, mindset. You, you have to stack talent at every single position like he did at USC, and you let those guys compete against each other. Uh, I think Drew alluded to it a little bit earlier about you bringing in a guy uh, like, like a Makuba, that, that's just going to, or Jabbar Muhammad rather, if they do, that just raises the room. That just raises the level. Everyone's going to have to get up to that standard now. And so with Silas Bolden, uh, this guy can do a little bit of everything. I feel like he's going to be in more of a Keelan Robinson type role, uh, especially on special teams, especially uh, what he can do out of the backfield. Paul, what is your vibe with Bolden? And 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 now that we know they're they're definitely done at poor at wide receiver in the portal, kind of you know where do they go next? Yeah, you, you combine Bond and Golden, and you get Bolden, right? So he of the three <laughs> has the most wiggle. Uh, he can run, uh, but he's got the most wiggle. He's got the most side yeah. to side. He's laterally explosive, and he's a little dog, man. I went and watched his his tape. Uh, that guy, he's 155 pounds soaking wet, five foot eight, and he competes, man. And he gets after it. Uh, he's just an elusive guy. And he's one of these guys that historically, uh, Texas fans have, have hated because they're just a little thorn in your side making plays. You know, they throw a little three yard face up route and the guy jukes two people. I was laughing because Aaron Sproles. Oh, he reminds me of the guys that, you know, They'd be showing the Bo Nix Heisman highlights, and he'd throw it out to Troy Franklin, a six-yard throw, and Franklin would juke a guy, run over a dude, and then outrun everyone else. And they're like, Bo Nix does it again. <laughs> and you're like, okay, well, to Drew's point, I hope we have that. Quinn Ewers throws that little ball out in the flat, and, and Silas makes three people lose their job, their starting job after the film session. And then everyone goes, Quinn Ewers does it again, you know, 80 yards later. So that's the hope that they, he could provide that kind of help. He's also useful on special teams. He's a kick returner. He brought back a punt for a touchdown last year. Yeah. And his best game was against Utah. And he wasn't just a little, like, gadget guy. He's out there running fade routes at five yeah. <laughs> laying out for the ball and also here's another thing that i think we will use to the keelan robinson point he's a good runner he's really good on fly and jet sweeps uh nine carries for 84 yards and two touchdowns last year uh like golden like bond he's got a knack for getting in the end zone and and there's something to that whether you're handing it to the guy or flipping it out to him or throwing it down the field it's just another weapon. It's another stress point on your defense. And I think he's going to be one of these guys that there's going to be certain game plans where we see a lack of speed, maybe in someone's secondary or an edge player or a nickel. And we're going to match this guy up on them and just mercilessly pick on it. And uh, I think he's going to be that guy that other fan bases really hate and that we grow to love because he goes out there and makes plays. And as they say, uh, you know, he's, He's small, but he's not little. If there's one position, and, and we've, we have we started the show with the Jabbar Muhammad update. He's going to be on campus by the time this airs. Mm -hmm. Texas is squarely in it. Bama's got a shot. 
Oregon's is fishing there as well. And then we went through the, the six guys that have all transferred uh, from the portal and enrolled. There's one position left, guys. There's one position left that I feel like Texas fans and, and even staffers would feel a little bit better with another body in that room, maybe a more experienced body. That's the tight end room, okay? And, and there's two guys right now that I think are squarely in the mix. We'll, we'll start with Stanford's uh, veteran, Benjamin Urasek, and there used to be a, a pretty strong narrative in recruiting over the last decade. If Stanford offered you at tight end, you better be the next offer. Uh, let them do the evaluating because they were nailing them left and right. Um, and, and I think that's obviously the, the, the overlap and carryover from Jim Harbaugh and what he's doing at Michigan now, which I think they have 27 tight ends on their roster, give or take. Um, Yursek is, is one of those guys that's experienced, whereas Amari Nyblack hasn't played as much, but may has been as effective. We saw what he did against Texas in week two. This is a six foot five, 235 pound monster, former uh, top 100 recruit out of high school. Drew, uh, the tight end spot, uh, Jatavian Sanders is leaving a big imprint. And that, those are big shoes to fill. Actually, I think he wears size 16 shoes. So those are relatively large shoes to fill. Do you have a preference? And what is your thoughts on, on Texas just getting another guy to go alongside Gunnar Helm and, and, and really solidifying that offensive unit heading into spring ball? I think naturally we want to we want a guy who can receive, right? We want a guy who can catch the ball, the guy who can make plays downfield. That's the natural thing that we say that we want. And what I think is more critical for us amongst these two guys, if these two guys are the options that we have for replacing uh, or just filling in that, that, that space, it's who doesn't tip our hand schematically. Right. Who can we bring into the game? And you don't know if we're blocking, if we're running, if we're throwing the ball, you have no idea what role they're going to play. And because I want a guy that we can trust and rely on to, to, to block in 12 personnel, which we love. I want a guy that when we need to throw him the ball, he's reliable. He doesn't need to be a volume receiver. He doesn't need his touches. He doesn't have an ego that requires that. Um, but, but going back, the schematic part of it, it's who can come in, whether they're receiving the ball or not, they give us an edge. And I love Nye Black. I, I love what he brings to the table. Uh, but he feels more of a slider build for me. Ben Yurisek has more girth just in general. When he's out on the field, I just feel he carries his weight a bit Better. A little bit uh, older. So, yeah, and he's, he's a bit older. He's, he's mature. So uh, it, it I, I lean that direction because, hey, you know, you have another tight end. He If he marches out there next year uh, at tight end, you don't know what we're going to do with him. Uh, where I do feel if, if Nye Black's out there, you're just going to assume, like, hey, we have to look out for this guy. We have to lean on this guy. Or let's test this guy. Let's see how strong he is. Let's see how physical he wants to be in coverage. And so – you just I, I'm comfortable with both options, but but I definitely from a schematic standpoint, I want 12 personnel to mean true 12 personnel uh, as we go into this offseason uh, with, with, with the guys that we're picking up. Paul, you've watched both of these guys. Do you have a preference? Uh, I like both. But Drew raised the most valid point, in my opinion, which is part of the reason you go into 12 personnel is can you force the other def can you force the defense out of their nickel? Right. Because. If you have Nye Black out there, Drew's point is they're just going to treat him as a receiver. Yes. They're going to treat him as a receiver lined up inside or maybe split out or even with a receiver with his hand down. Uh, they're going to say, stay in nickel. We're fine. Your set comes out there and he's not necessarily a, a pure blocker, right? He's, he's a good receiver in his own right. In fact, that's right. He's, he's more on the receiver side of the genus of tight end than, than blocker. But to Drew's point, he's more balanced. He's older. He's more mature. Uh, so when he comes out there with Gunnar Helm, who has similar traits to Eurosec, well, now you got a little bit of a bind because if you That's stay the in that Spider Man nickel, meme, looking at each yes, other, exactly. <laughs> if you stay in that nickel, you're now assigning a gap over a tight end, a run gap to a DB. So you better have like Drew Kelson at safety and not the 185 pound coverage dude. Because 185 pound coverage dude is going to get stock blocked and planted <laughs> 10 yards downfield while Jaden Blue runs right behind him. That's not very tantalizing for a DC. So 
those are the kinds of schematic choices that your personnel can force. That all said, Steve Sarkeesian has plenty of stuff that he could scheme up for Amari Nyblak. Uh, I think we'd be happy with either. Yeah. Uh, but I do think that is something that people tend to look at the 40 time or the recruit ranking and they go, I want that guy. But Drew's raising some very valid, like real world on field points about what your hand is tipping based on your personnel choice. So that's a great contribution. And we know Sark is the anti tendency. At least he wants to be. He 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 wants to change those things on a weekly basis, which any you know offensive mind that that that's always kind of part of it. And so I, I definitely think. Losing Mitchell, losing Worthy, losing Whittington. I mean, not just the production, but just the talent and, and what that made the defense do. I am really curious how they're going to mix and match these guys with guys that are already on campus, with your Jonte Cook, with, with, with your, you know, um, Don, DeAndre Moore, Ryan Wingo, Parker Livingstone, guys that are coming in as well. Um, gentlemen. Once again, another fantastic X's and O's episode. So thankful and grateful for you guys to, to join us, to come on there. One more time for my man, Andre the Lawyer. Andre the Lawyer is located in Dallas, Texas. He helps with injured Longhorns, car wrecks, slip and falls, 18 wheelers, uh, wrongful deaths, on the job injuries, anything that happens, my man. If you get in that, in, in, in that, that, that problem, that issue, Andre the Lawyer is the guy to call. 214-444-8808. Andre the Lawyer. Give him a buzz. The lifetime Longhorn and longtime Inside Texas reader. Gentlemen, this was insightful. This was fun because Texas has brought in six guys from the portal and they have hit a need in every single one. And the only other spot, in my opinion, I would always take an extra defensive lineman. And I think they're still going to need an extra defensive lineman post spring. I think when that window reopens, we're going to see a few more guys potentially coming into the mix or, or, or trying to add rather losing Jamari Caldwell to Oregon, I think was, was a bigger burn than people are actually talking about. And so they want to make sure that, and then also with DeAndre Robinson getting out of his letter of intent from the class of 2024, you got to fill that hole. And so I feel like post spring when people ask what's going to happen at D line, I think we'll see more action there. Um, gentlemen, any parting thoughts on this uh, as we wrap up another episode? Portals open. I would just say <laughs> If we keep killing it in the portal like this, we're going to have some SEC opponents who are going to need to call Andre the lawyer for their hurt feelings. Right? <laughs> also, man. Jatavian Sanders has size 16 feet. Have you ever seen his hands? Oh, my I call goodness. Him, I, I, met, I met Jatavian when he was a freshman, and he kind of had some baby fat. And he wasn't really like what he looked, obviously what he looks like now. And then in about two years, he just morphed like the chest just came out and everything. And he used to have these hands and I call them bear claw hands. And he's like, what? why do you call my hands bear claws? I said, do you remember when you're a kid and you got to the donut stop, donut, donut, donut store and you got one, you got to pick one donut. I always pick that, that apple fritter, that bear claw, that apple fritter, because it was the biggest donut. I might not even like apples, but I was a kid. I wanted the biggest, most sugar packed thing I could get. He's got bear claw, apple fritter hands. I mean, these things are like catcher's mitts. And so, yeah, his feet are large, his hands are large, and that booty's large too. And I think that's why Bill Belichick's probably going to take him in the second round, um, whenever whoever he's coaching for, maybe Dallas. <laughs> I digress. Thank you so much for joining us. Please like and subscribe to Inside Texas Football YouTube channel powered by InsideTexas.com. We're so thankful and grateful for, for the rise and, and, and the growing in this community, and we only want to get bigger. Please help us get to those 6,000 subscriptions. And also come see us at InsideTexas.com. I say it a lot, and I'm going to say it even more. It is an absolute great community. Let us earn your dollar. Give it. It's a dollar for a month right now. Let us earn it. Let us earn your business. Give us a chance. Uh, join join InsideTexas.com and, and be updated on all this new stuff because we got some tied in stuff coming through. Uh, so it's always good to, to, to stay at stay uh, stay in the in the know. Gentlemen, uh, thank you so much for joining us. For Drew Kelson, for Paul Wadlington, I'm Justin Wells. Thank you for making us part of your day.